church's one foundation. God bless you, Pastor Mike. Well, let me ask you to turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 6 this morning. I hope you've had a good week. I've had a good week. It's been one of the busiest weeks I think I've had in quite some time. Um, in fact, this morning I was a little forgetful. I started to leave the house without my wallet, which would not have been good since it has my driver's license in it. And as we're driving down the road, I said to Pamela, you know, I left my watch at home. And she said, oh, no. <laughs> and I just kept digging deeper, I guess, because after that, I said, I wonder if somebody at church would loan me one. And she said, oh, yeah, I'm sure that, I'm sure many would be... Uh, so I'm not going to ask for volunteers this morning. I'll just uh, keep my eye on things somewhat. So Acts chapter 6, let me begin reading with verse 1. And if you'd like to stand with me for the reading of God's Word, you may do so. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number... A complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, these they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. Now look at verse 7. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Would you pray with me? As we ask God to open our hearts this morning, let's recall how the psalmist prayed in Psalm 119, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. And so in the words of an old Anglican prayer, let's ask the Lord to do this. Father, what we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us. What we are not, Make us for the sake of your Son, our Savior. This is our prayer, O Lord. Open our eyes that we may see what you would have us to see, that we may worship as you would have us worship, and that we may live as you would have us live. In the all-sufficient, all-glorious, and holy name of King Jesus, our Messiah, I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. The book of Acts is a thrilling account of God's mighty work in the early church. The book of Acts is also a very sobering account of the persistent attacks of the devil in seeking to stop the ministry and the growth of the early church. In fact, the devil sought to inflict as much damage on that body of believers as he possibly could. But you know who wins in the end, right? I'll give you a hint. It's not the devil. Of course, you already knew that. But let's think back for a moment and see something interesting about Satan's strategy in the early church here in the book of Acts. At the end of chapter 4... We have the wonderful example of a man by the name of Barnabas selling his property 
and giving the proceeds to the church for God to use. Then you'll recall that at the very beginning of the next chapter, chapter 5, Satan influences a couple by the name of Ananias and Sapphira to also sell property. But unlike Barnabas, unlike Barnabas, they pretended to give all the proceeds when in reality they only gave part of them. Now they didn't have to give all of it. The problem here, as you'll recall, was their dishonesty, their pretense, their hypocrisy. And we read, of course, that God used Peter to expose their dishonesty. And as a result, the church was purified and propelled forward all the more. Then, as we saw last Sunday at the end of chapter 5, the apostles were assaulted by the religious rulers for preaching the gospel. That was their crime. They were preaching the gospel. They were seeing lives changed. They were seeing miracles and wonders and God doing amazing things in the community. After being beaten, the Bible tells us the apostles went away rejoicing that they had been counted worthy to suffer for Jesus. What a response, right? That was their response to suffering. They rejoiced in it and they continued preaching and teaching about Jesus. So, Satan loses again, but he doesn't give up. He doesn't. For when you look at the first verse in chapter 6, you see good news and bad news. The good news is that the church is growing. The bad news is that people are complaining. You see, if persecution from without doesn't work, the devil seeks to create division from within. And so that's what he is doing here once again. Now, as we think about the first seven verses in chapter 6, I want us to see four supremely important lessons that are so important for us today. First of all, we should celebrate God-given growth in the church. We should celebrate growth that is God given. The first part of verse 1 says that the disciples were increasing in number. Now, the growth we see here is growth that God Himself gave as a result of the faith and obedience of the church. We never read about gimmicks in the life of the first century church, do we? No watered down sermons, no flashing lights and smoke machines to make the worship more exciting. As you know, crowds can be gathered in a variety of ways, but a true church is built only through people embracing the gospel and seeking to spread it more and more and more. So the growth in the early church came as a result of gospel-centered preaching and compassionate ministry. And this kind of growth should always be celebrated. Secondly, we should protect the unity of the church. Here's the second lesson that I would draw from this passage in Acts 6. We should diligently protect the unity of God's church. Now, within the church in those days, there were two groups of Jews. There were Greek-speaking Jews and there were Hebrew-speaking Jews, or more likely Aramaic-speaking. And we find in verse 1 that the Jews with a Greek background complained that their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. They felt that the Hebrew widows were being favored in this matter, and so there was conflict in the church. Now, undoubtedly, the devil's goal in all of this was to divide the membership and discourage the leadership. And of course, Satan continues this strategy against churches to this very day. It reminds me of the great evangelist, George Whitfield, who once stepped into a stagecoach about to leave Edinburgh, Scotland. This was back in the 18th century or so, perhaps yeah, late 18th or mid, uh, anyway, it was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, you can tell that by the word stagecoach, right? 
a lady who belonged to a different denomination happened to step into the same coach. But when she saw Whitfield, she became alarmed and said, Are you not Mr. Whitfield? He said, Yes, madam. She exclaimed, Oh, then let me get out. Whitfield calmly replied, Surely, madam. But before you go, let me ask you one question. Suppose you die and go to heaven, and then suppose I die and go there also. When I come in, will you go out? Well, you know, those words struck home, and the lady stayed put. She even kindly, cordially shook Whitfield's hand, and they continued the journey together. It's true, God can use a timely word to diffuse confrontation and to resolve conflict, something that we clearly see here in Acts chapter 6. But when trouble comes, it's easy to become discouraged and want to give up. However, just remember the wise words of Samuel Chadwick. He said, if you're successful, don't crow. If you're defeated, don't croak. Well, the apostles refused to crow or to croak. They refused to throw up their hands in frustration. And as a result of God working through them, it was not the apostles who were defeated. It was Satan who was defeated by the wisdom that God gave to them. We see in verse 2 that the apostles said to the congregation, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Now, obviously, the distribution of food to the poor was an extremely important ministry and one that the apostles took seriously, one that all of the church members took seriously. But the apostles would not allow it to divert them from their calling from God. They wanted to help, of course, but they knew that they could not do everything. And they must not neglect the responsibilities that God had specifically given to them. They must not neglect praying, preaching, teaching, and serving in those capacities. So they went on to ask the people to find seven men that the apostles could put in charge of resolving this conflict that had entered into the church. Now, do you think everyone was pleased when the apostles said that they weren't going to personally distribute resources to the widows any longer? That instead they were going to delegate this responsibility to others? I doubt everyone was pleased. I mean, can't you just imagine a widow asking, now who are you? Parmenas. Never heard of you. Where's Peter? I want his shadow to fall on me. I'm not feeling very well today. Now, clearly the people needed to avoid such complaining and the apostles needed to handle the situation wisely and graciously they certainly had the authority to make a decision on this issue that was threatening to divide the church. But they notice this, they wisely chose to involve the people in solving the problem. Verse 5 says that this approach pleased the whole gathering. Now there's no doubt that the local church is to be led by its pastors or elders, men who are to be spirit-filled, who are themselves under the lordship of Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible never pictures the church as a democracy. And neither does the Bible ever picture it as a dictatorship. After all, Jesus is the head of the church and the Lord of the church. And so, as a church, we are to function under His absolute direction. So, in these verses today, we have the first glimpse of that happy blending of pastoral authority and congregational involvement, and all for the purpose of working toward a united decision. And that's the way churches should be characterized today, isn't it? It's the biblical pattern. Now, it's also important to note that the apostles provided guidance about what sort of man should be chosen to meet this problem 
particular need in the church at that time. He must be of good reputation. He must be full of the Spirit, and he must be full of wisdom. So these men obviously must be well respected and known among the community. They must show clear evidence of being filled with the Spirit. And they must know not only what needs to be done, but how to go about doing it. So that would require great wisdom. It would require wisdom from God. So you see, it wasn't a matter of the apostles simply saying to the congregation, just come up with seven guys and then we will assign them to this task. No, no. It's very clear that these servants were to be spiritually qualified to take on this responsibility. Now, it's also interesting that the seven names, listen to this, the seven names mentioned in verse 5 are Greek names, all of them. I think that was a wise move on the part of the believers as well as an expression of love and unity. After all, it was the Greek-speaking Jews who were complaining about their widows being slighted. So apparently those with a Greek background were given the authority to resolve the situation. And they did. Furthermore, they would be better equipped to serve and communicate with Greek-speaking widows. No wonder then that the apostles ask that these seven men be of good reputation, full of the Spirit, and full of what? Wisdom. So we should celebrate God-given growth in the church. We should protect the unity of the church. Notice this, thirdly, we should keep right priorities in the church. In verse 4, the apostles said to the people, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. You see, there must be no mistake about the fundamental priority of Christian ministry. And that's the proclamation of God's Word, the proclamation of the gospel. Many things are important and necessary in ministry. They are. But they all are subordinate to the message of the gospel, and they flow from it. So in verse 4, the leaders believe their ministry should consist of praying, teaching, preaching, and they were faithful to fulfill God's calling upon their lives. It's so easy for any of us to become involved in other things, so involved in other things, even good things, that we neglect the most important things of all. I don't want to be like the preacher who was not known for his study habits and who was talking with a Quaker one day. Now, this preacher was a fox hunter, as it happens. So the Quaker said to him, if I were a fox and wanted to hide from thee, I'd hide where you would not find me. The preacher said, and where's that? And the Quaker replied, in your study. In the book of Acts, we see clearly that the apostles stayed absolutely devoted to doing what God had called them to do. They were to pray, study the Word, proclaim the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit, and for the glory of God alone. Now, not all believers are called to preach and teach, but all believers are called to pray, read, study, and meditate on the Word of God. The great reformer Martin Luther suggested three questions to ask as you read and meditate on a passage of Scripture each day. Here they are. What should I praise God for in light of this text? What sin do I confess in light of this text? And what do I need to ask God for in light of this text? In other words, he's saying it's not simply a matter of reading through the daily portion. It's a matter of interacting with it to the point where you're being continually changed and matured through the power of God's Word. And these questions help us do this. 
Here they are again. What should I praise God for in light of this text? In light of what I've just read in the Word, what is there that I can right now give praise to God for? That's a good question, isn't it? What should I praise Him for in light of this text? Secondly, what sin do I confess in light of this text? And thirdly, what do I need to ask God for in light of what I've just read? These are simple questions, but they are so profound. And I think it would be great to keep them at hand anytime we are reading the living Word of God. And I think the first century apostles would have appreciated Luther's questions as well. How do I know? Because they said, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And you and I, no matter our particular calling or responsibility, you and I are to do the same. We are to be devoted to God and to His Word so that every day we're growing in His grace. Well, we should celebrate God-given growth in the church. We should protect the unity of the church. We should keep right priorities in the church. And lastly, we should trust God to use problems in the church for His own purposes. You see, once God-given wisdom was exercised, the early church continued to grow. Think about the flow of that for just a moment. At the very beginning of chapter 6, the church is growing. Great things are happening. But then all of a sudden... There's an issue. There's trouble. There's conflict. And I don't think anyone was intentionally neglecting the Greek-speaking widows. There could have been a communication issue there. There undoubtedly was an administrative issue there. The church was growing so quickly, and I'm sure the apostles initially were trying to handle all of the particulars. And so a conflict arises, we're told, in the very first part of chapter 6, right after we're told that the church is really doing well. It's going forward. It's growing. People are coming to Christ. The community is changing. Then there's a problem. But because God gave wisdom in the midst of that situation... The end of that story, that particular aspect of church life, ends on such a positive note showing us that God uses difficulties and conflict and problems and adversities for His purposes. He brings good out of evil, right? He brings good out of difficulty. I think about Genesis 50. And the situation with Joseph and how his brothers had so mistreated him in earlier years. And as you will recall the story, Joseph, through God's grace and power, rose to a position of incredible prominence in the land of Egypt. Second in command to Pharaoh only. And then because of a famine in Canaan, his brothers, who had not seen him for some 20 years came down to Egypt to buy food and they stood before Joseph, not recognizing him, but he recognized them. The story ends with Joseph finally revealing himself to his brothers. And can you imagine the expression on their faces when that happened? Oh my, let's see, this is our long lost brother Joseph, whom we tried to kill, whom we sold into bondage, and now he's prime minister over all the land of Egypt, and we're standing here asking him for a handout, <laughs> and Joseph could have said, I'll give you a handout, but he didn't. Why? He was a man of God. And he said to his brothers, what you intended for evil, God meant for good. 
Because you see, Joseph, as the prime minister, had the responsibility of distributing food. Sounds a little bit, a little bit like Acts 6, doesn't it? He had that responsibility during this time of famine. God had given him wisdom to store up food because he knew the famine was coming. And so while his brothers are at his mercy, Joseph is a man of grace and says, I'm going to take care of you. Don't you see what God has done here? Yes, you mistreated me. You did wrong. But out of this situation, God has brought amazing good because he's placed me in this position here in Egypt and now I can help you and your families and my father Jacob, who is back in Canaan. <laughs> they went back home and said, guess what? Your son Joseph is not dead after all. He's second only to the Pharaoh. He wants us to come. He's going to take care of us. <laughs> and so they went. And God, through Joseph, took care of the entire clan and from that, of course, over time, grew the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. And from that came the Messiah who died for you and for me, giving himself freely and fully so that we might be forgiven of all sin and become the children of God, walking with him daily with the assurance that we know him and one day he'll come back and receive us unto himself that we might spend eternity in heaven. Don't you think when you consider the flow of all of that, God is able to bring good out of problems? And so we see it right here, don't we? Problems in the church, problems in the church. But there was also, by God's grace, wisdom in the church. And God turned the situation around for his purposes, for his glory, and the church moved forward all the more. And so we read in verse 7, And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. So problems and conflicts don't keep God from working, do they? They don't keep his purposes from being fulfilled. They don't keep the gospel from being proclaimed. They don't keep his church from growing. In fact, the absence of problems often indicates that nothing is happening. I mean, there aren't many problems in a cemetery. The truth is that God uses problems, conflicts, perplexities, and the trials of life to drive us to himself. Perhaps you've heard the old poem, we mutter and we sputter, we fume and we spurt, we mumble and grumble, our feelings get hurt, we can't understand things, our vision grows dim when all we need is a moment with Him. Are you spending time with Him? Oh, time in His presence and in His Word changes everything. We get a new perspective. We get a changed heart. We get a different attitude. So in the midst of whatever problems we face, Jesus says this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Rest. What a promise. What a promise. Nothing could stop the message of the gospel from being proclaimed, and nothing could stop people from believing it and coming to faith in Christ. So very quickly, what is the message of the gospel that the early believers proclaimed and that we proclaim today? What is the message that the devil is so intent on stopping? Here it is. The gospel is the good news that the one and only God who is perfectly holy made us in his image that we might know him. But we sinned and cut ourselves off from him with no possibility of saving ourselves. Yet in his great love, God became a man in his son, Jesus. He lived a perfect life. He went to the cross and died. In doing so, Jesus took on himself the punishment we deserve for our sin. And as a result, he completely satisfied God's justice on our behalf. 
Jesus then rose from the dead showing that God had fully accepted his sacrifice for sin. And so God now calls for sinners to repent of their sins and to trust in Christ alone for their forgiveness and for the gift of eternal salvation. Those who do are born again into a new life, an eternal life with God. Aren't you thankful He has provided the way out of our spiritual darkness. He has provided the way out of our sin, our guilt, our condemnation. What we could never do, what no one could ever do, God has done through His Son who gave Himself for you and for me so that through Him and Him alone we might have life. Through Him we might have hope. Through Him we might have forgiveness. Through Him and Him alone we might have joy. Do you know Him? Salvation is only in Him. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. There is no life, no hope, no forgiveness, no joy, no fulfillment in life, no peace apart from Jesus. But thank God, Jesus offers all of that and even more. Praise His name. It was a great theologian, Augustine, who prayed, You have formed us for yourself. And our hearts are restless till they find rest in you. Oh, I urge you today, my friend, if you've never truly given your life to Jesus who died that we might be set free, call upon him today. Call upon him. Find your life in him, your forgiveness, your hope, your purpose for this life and for all eternity. Let's pray together. Father, you are our life and you are our hope. We could never thank you enough for who you are and what you've done. But we do thank you. We do worship. We do rejoice. Oh, Father, by your Holy Spirit, Draw each of us unto yourself. For any who cannot say in all honesty, I have the complete assurance of heaven. May this be the day, O Lord, when they will call on your name, repent of sin, and place their faith in Jesus alone for that indescribable gift of salvation. For all of us who know Christ, may this be a day of are drawing nearer and rejoicing all the more with all our heart and with a desire to be used of you while we are still on this earth. In the name-